In this video, I'm going to show you how to build this simplified forest fire simulation and how to plot the data as the fire spreads. In a previous video, I discussed the big book of small Python projects and its benefits for advancing your Python programming skills. In this video, we'll be taking one project from the book and rewriting the code step by step in our own way. And as a bonus, I'll be solving one of these challenges at the bottom of the page. Now, if you're not familiar with the big book of small Python projects, it's a completely free book written by Al Swigart, which you can download from his website. You'll also find other really useful Python books here too, and I've added a link in the description for anybody interested. But the Big Book of Small Python Projects provides over 80 simple Python projects for beginners, and I plan to go over more of these projects in later videos. For this video, I've skipped directly to Project 29, and I'm going to walk you through the project now. This forest has constantly growing trees that have a 1% probability of catching fire if struck by lightning. The chance of a fire spreading depends on how close these trees are to one another. But by adjusting the growth and lightning strike rates, different patterns in the forest emerge. This program creates complex behavior through the use of a small set of simple rules. And this is one example of emergent behavior. Our Swigart simulation runs on the command line, but I wanted to represent our simulation using 2D graphics for the trees and the fire. So we're going to need to make some modifications to our Swigart's code. I'm assuming you've already set up Python on your system, but if you haven't, I've got two videos in the card above that can help you out. Once you have Python and your preferred IDE installed, we can move on to installing Pygame with pip. Now, I've opened up a terminal and checked the version of Python I have on my system, and I've used the command python-v to do this. This command will only work if you have Python on your system path. If you get a message saying Python is not recognized as an internal or external command, you can use the command where Python to locate the directory of your Python executable. Simply cd or change directory into this location and you'll be able to access Python from here. Alternatively, if you're using a Mac or Linux, you can use the command which Python. Open a terminal or command line and type pip install pygame. If this command fails, it might be because you've installed a new version of Python that hasn't been out for very long. But we can still install Pygame by attaching the pre flag at the end of the command, like so. This will install the latest pre release version of the package, but it should still work for us. Now, to test Pygame is installed properly, open up an IDE and type import Pygame. When you run this code, you should get a welcome message from the Pygame community. We must set up our folder structure. Now this is going to be a very simple setup, but you must have this exact folder structure because we'll be using a specific folder address later to access our fire and tree graphics. For all those interested, I downloaded these graphics from a website called CraftPix, but I have the full code and the graphics on my GitHub page if you want to download those. Now I'm going to keep Swigart's code on the right hand side of the screen and we're going to build this simulation from the ground up and I'll explain what the code is doing as we progress. I'll also make some slight modifications to his code but this is simply due to making his code more intuitive for myself and it also demonstrates to you guys that you can be flexible in the way you write your own programs. We're going to start off with this statement. What this is essentially doing is checking if this Python file is being executed as the main program and not simply being imported by another file. This name variable is a special variable in Python that gets assigned a value based on how the file is being executed. If we run this file directly either here in our IDE or on the command line like so, The name variable will contain the main string and the interpreter can then jump into our main function. I've also left out the try accept statement 
because we'll be using Pygame to exit our program gracefully rather than using a keyboard interrupt. Because we're using Pygame in our example, we need to add some boilerplate code to set up the display window and to ensure we can close our program properly. Pygame init initializes all the Pygame modules and must be called before any other Pygame methods. This line beneath sets up our Pygame window with the constant screen width and screen height. And within our main function, I've set up a basic game loop that continuously checks for all events that have occurred within our game window. If the user tries to close the window, the Pygame engine will stop and the exit method is called. This helps us avoid any errors or crashes from ending the program abruptly. Now, when we run our program, we get a blank window with a width and a height of 800 pixels. This will eventually display our forest. Our next step is to create our initial forest with a random distribution of trees. Now, Svigards uses a dictionary to store the locations of the trees on a map. I personally found this way of doing things a bit counterintuitive. So I instead decided to use a 2D list. My 2D list will either contain a T to represent a tree or blank space to represent the absence of a tree. To create a random forest, I used a list comprehension and have a video above that explains them in more detail. But what we're doing here is cycling through the entire two dimensional array using these for loops and inserting a t if our random function produces a number that is less or equal to 0.5, which in this case is a 50% probability. For a random number above 0.5 and below 1, we simply insert a blank space, which signifies no tree should exist here. I've also introduced the constants map width and map height, and they simply specify the number of grid cells our forest contains where one grid cell can only contain one object. This two-dimensional forest gets returned whenever we call our function, and I've just done that at the top of our main function. If we print out our forest list, we'll get a glimpse of what our initial forest will look like. But we really want to display our forest in a way that's more visually appealing. And to do that, we need to import our tree image and display our forest in our game window. We import the tree image from our graphics folder using the pygame image load method. And I've also used the path join method from the Python standard library. So our code will automatically use the correct file path separator for the platform that we're using. In other words, our code will work correctly on Windows, Linux, or Mac OS systems. The convert alpha method simply ensures that any part of the tree image that is meant to be transparent will be so in the Pygame window. Within our while loop, I've added a screen fill, which will change the background to a nice green color and the Pygame display update method will redraw the game window. We've placed this code within our while loop because we'll be needing to continually overwrite the screen with new images as the state of the world changes. Beneath the screen fill method, we'll add a function call to a new function we'll create in a minute. This function will loop through our forest list and print our tree image whenever the loop comes across the character T in our 2D forest list. The display forest function takes in our forest list as an argument and uses two nested for loops to cycle through each element in our forest list. And it does this one row at a time. If we encounter a T, we use Pygame's blitz method to draw our tree image at these locations on our Pygame window, where the tile size is a constant that represents the size of our tree image. When we multiply this by the current X and Y positions in our list, our Pygame window can be represented as a grid that exactly mimics our 2D list. This ELIF clause will overwrite any grid square on our game window with a fire graphic if it finds the character F in our list. This will be important later when we want to give our forest the ability to catch and spread fire. But for now, 
this ELIF clause will be ignored. However, we will still need to import the fire graphic to ensure this code doesn't throw any errors. Now when we run this, it should display our newly created forest in our game window. Currently, our forest doesn't do very much. We want this forest to evolve over time by growing new trees in empty spaces and maybe catching fire by being struck by lightning. In order to evolve our forest over time, we need to create a duplicate 2D list that will temporarily contain all our trees, fire and empty space for our next time step. Now the reason we can't simply overwrite our current forest list as we inspect each grid square is because we have to go through all elements in our forest in our current time step before we can make any changes to the forest. Each time step is meant to represent a snapshot in time where all elements are interacting simultaneously. Unfortunately, because our program can only inspect and modify one grid square at a time rather than all at once, we have to wait until the process is finished and temporarily store our results in a duplicate forest list. When our program is done processing all the grid squares in our forest, we can copy our duplicate forest over to our forest list where it will be ready for our next time step. So we're going to call our temporary forest next forest and this will also be represented as a 2D list. Our next forest will start off with empty cells and our program will populate this list gradually as we cycle through our current forest. Again, I've initialized the next forest list with a list comprehension simply because list comprehensions are less computationally intensive. Next, we have a nested for loop that will cycle through every element in our current forest and decide what to do based on what is found in each grid square. For example, if we find an empty space, we might place a new tree here in the next time step. If there's already a tree present, there's a small chance it'll get struck by lightning and catch fire. And if we find this grid square is already on fire, we will spread this fire to neighboring trees. First, we'll focus on empty spaces in our forest in this time step. If the current grid square is blank and a randomly generated number between 0 and 1 is less than or equal to 0.2, place a tree in the same position in our next forest. If our forest contains anything else other than an empty space, we simply copy the contents of our forest grid cell into the next forest list. This process continues until every grid square has been evaluated and the next forest has been updated with everything we need for the next time step. Now we can overwrite our forest list with our next forest list. When the interpreter cycles back to the top of the while loop, the display forest function will update the memory buffer with the latest forest and will print its contents to the screen the next time it reaches the pygame update function. I've also added a sleep function with a pause length of half a second so we can see our forest grow gradually. So let's run this and see what happens. Our current nested for loop is behaving as we expected. A new tree is born in an empty space with 20% probability and current existing trees continue to live in all future time steps. Now we need to add some lightning to our simulation. A tree struck by lightning will catch fire and we'll need to show this with our fire graphic. To do this, we need to go back to our nested for loop. Beneath this if statement where we create a new tree, we use an elif statement which will only execute if the if statement above returns false. The elif statement checks if the current forest's grid square contains a tree, and it also checks if a random generated number exceeds the fire chance threshold. I've set the fire chance to 1%, exactly the same as Swigart's code. So essentially, if the grid square has a tree, there is a 1% chance it will catch fire in the next time step. In other words, next forest will store an F in this location. And if you remember the display forest function below, we've already told our simulation what to do if it finds the character F in the forest list. We can run our script again now 
And you'll see our forest both grow trees and set current trees on fire until the whole forest is burning. Now we come to the most complicated section of the simulation. When a tree is on fire, there is a 100% chance that this fire will spread to all neighbouring trees. So when we check our forest grid square within our nested for loop, if this cell is on fire, we need to look at the eight neighbouring squares. If we find a tree, we need to set it on fire in the next time step. However, if our program has already processed this neighbouring tree and decided it is to be struck by lightning, we don't need to ask our program to set it on fire a second time. It's just a waste of processor time. What we can do is place an if statement at the top of our nested for loop and skip the loop iteration if our next forest already contains some content in this grid cell. And if you look at Spygart's code on the right, he does the same thing. This if statement is simply saying to our for loops, don't worry about this grid square. We've already decided what it's going to be in the next time step. Just continue with the next grid square. And I've just noticed here that I put my next forest list comprehension outside my while loop and it really should be within the while loop because we need to reset our temporary forest every single time step. Another problem we face when checking our eight neighbouring cells is if we're on a corner or on the top, bottom or sides, some of those neighbouring cells won't exist. If our program tries to access these non-existent cells in memory, we'll get an out of bounds error and our program will crash. And this is why this section is so complicated to code. So let's try and tackle this problem. Just like Spygart's code, we can create an elif statement that runs only if the two if statements above return false. We only want to process the eight neighbouring squares if this square is on fire. We use the two nested for loops to cycle through nine grid squares, with the fire being in the centre square, and we use the range of minus one to plus one, so we can move our current attention to cells on opposite sides of the centre cell. First we need to check that our focus hasn't fallen off the top of the map or the left hand side. And we do this by ensuring that the grid cell we're focusing on within this nested for loop has a positive coordinate value. Next, we need to check if we're trying to access a grid square that is off the bottom or the right of the map. And we do this by seeing if our grid coordinate value has a larger value than the map width or height. And we're using a negative one here because our coordinate system starts at zero instead of one. Finally, if we know we're within the map, we can check if this neighbouring cell is a tree. If it is, we set this on fire in the next time step. The last thing we need to do is extinguish the fire after it's been burning for one time step. Otherwise, the fires will never burn out. And that's the complete simulation. So let's test it out. So you can mess around with the constants above to see what happens. I increase the growth rate and the initial tree density to 99%. And after a while, this settles on a stable pattern of tree growth and fire spread. But have a play around yourself to see what happens. At the bottom of Swigant's chapter, he suggests some improvements you can make. One of these involves adding a fixed probability that a neighbouring tree will catch fire. Currently, in our simulation, there is a 100% probability that neighbouring trees will catch fire and so fire spreads quite rapidly. But we only need to make a small adjustment to our code to vary this probability. And we can add another if statement just before assigning an F to our next forest. And this if statement will only be true if the random number is less than or equal to the fire spread chance, which in our code above we've set to 50%. And that's pretty much it. Now you have direct control on how easily the fire will spread. The very last thing we're going to do is plot both the land area occupied by trees and occupied by fire every single time step. To do this, we're going to use a Python library called matplotlib. And again, we're going to need pip to install this for us. Type in pip install matplotlib. And within our code, we can now import matplotlib PyPlot. Our next step is to create some empty lists 
that will store the number of trees and fires present at each time step, and these lists will grow as the simulation advances. So to prevent these lists growing indefinitely, we need to change the while loop into a for loop. This way, we can control the exact number of time steps we want our simulation to run for, and in our code, we'll set the simulation length to 30 time steps. To count the number of tree instances in our forest, we iterate over each row in our 2D list and count the number of T characters using the count method. We also use a generator expression to create a sequence of these counts for each row and pass this sequence to the sum function to get the total number of T characters in the entire 2D list. We can do the same with the fire count as well. With this tree and fire count, we can calculate the percentage of land they occupy on the map, and this percentage is then appended to the trees and fires list. Once our simulation has run its course, we can plot the trees and fires list to see how the landscape changes over time. And that's it for this video. I highly recommend you try and solve the rest of the problems that Swigart has suggested in his chapter. The more you practice projects like these, the better you'll get at both reading and writing your own code. I will cover more of his projects in later videos, so do let me know in the comments what you want me to go through next. But until then, I wish you guys all the best with your programming projects, and I'll see you soon.